Nick from Income Digs. Welcome to this video tutorial. Today we're talking about real estate accounting. We're going to be talking about QuickBooks. We're going to be purchasing property and recording that HUD statement, the settlement statement, the closing statement into our accounting books. Okay, so this is a skill that you definitely need to learn if you're in real estate. You're going to need to record a HUD settlement statement at least once and hopefully more times. And uh, what I, we're going to use is a sample HUD I just found online, just this simple kind of transaction. Simple but a little complex. Uh, there's quite a bit into it. Um, we, we're purchasing a property for $475,000. There's a loan involved. So I'm going to show you how to deal with all of that, all the closing costs, etc., to get those in your accounting books the right way. All right. Um, and so to get into this, uh, one thing I want to bring up ahead of time is a deposit because I get this question all the time when it comes to purchasing property or even selling a property, is how do you deal with the deposit that we put down ahead of time? So you see on this closing statement that among plenty of other things that are going on, I have a deposit or earnest money of $5,000, meaning I've already paid that and that's gonna be coming off of my closing. Okay, it's really common, it happens in almost every single transaction. So the question is how do we deal with that? Well. If we purchase this property, and we're going to assume that we purchased this in March 2019, we'll pretend that's 2019, uh, we probably exchanged a deposit maybe in January or February when we went under contract for the property, past our inspection, whatever that is, okay? So we're going to typically record that in some way ahead of the closing, and then we're going to deal with it again at closing. So I'm going to show you how to do that first. All right, so let's go to my QuickBooks setup. And I'm just on my balance sheet right now, and you can see that my balance sheet is really simple. All I have is $100,000 in the checking account. I have really nothing else going on with my books at this point in time. All right, so the first thing we would need to do is deal with that deposit. Again, pretending that we purchased in March, we put that deposit down maybe in February. You can go ahead and create an expense for that deposit. You can do an expense or a check. I typically work mostly in expenses because I'm not doing too much printing uh, from checks, but up to you. Okay, so let's pretend this is 2-15-2019. And the category here, this is going to be a fixed asset account. And I've created this account called es uh, Closing Escrow. And basically that account is kind of like a holding account so that when money leaves my checking account, it goes somewhere that's not my checking account, but still an asset, it's still mine technically. It's going to be put toward my purchase. If the deal should fall through, I'm gonna get that back, right? It's pretty much just like held hostage by our um, either the real estate attorney or the broker or something, right? So it's a fixed asset. So I set that up and you can see it's a other current asset uh, account. That's what I meant, a uh, current asset, not a fixed asset. It's certainly an asset, no question about it. And description, I can just say uh, deposit. The amount is $5,000. I'm gonna tag this to a customer. Uh, the way that I'm, I'm teaching my clients to deal with properties is to call them a customer and then tenants would be below that as sub-customers. So this property is 1254 Main Street. Okay, so I have a customer for that, 1254 Main Street. If I didn't, I would just you know write in what it's gonna be and add that customer. For this video, I'm not gonna deal with classes at this point, okay? So you could use class to differentiate between properties. However, um, with the latest updates to QuickBooks, I don't recommend it. QuickBooks is limiting how many classes you can use. So customers is unlimited, that way uh, you can kind of do as many as you need, you don't have to worry about the limits. All right, so if I save and close this, let's see, now it's warning me about the class, that's okay. Let's see what happens here. Uh, you see that I have 95,000 in my checking account and 5,000 in closing escrow, that's exactly how I want it to look, and then we're gonna deal with this at closing. All right, so now let's deal with that closing. Before we get into that, I just wanna show you my chart of accounts quickly. Um, when you record a purchase of property, Items that are going to go into many different categories. And what I'm showing you right now is the breakout of how I differentiate my buildings and land. So I have one sub, one parent account called buildings and land. And below that, I have a few different categories. I have buildings, I have land, I have amortized closing costs, and I have CapEx. Okay. So I would suggest you kind of set these up ahead of time. And, and then they're there for you when you make your journal entry. If you don't, you can always create them on the fly, but I like to kind of have them ready. So let me just go back to that report so that I can have it at my disposal. So there's my balance sheet. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna start translating this HUD. I'm gonna bring this outside so that we can kind of have split screen here. Okay, so there's my balance sheet. Here's my closing statement. 
and I'm going to work on this journal entry. Now, why a journal entry? Well, I almost always do a journal entry for closing on property. A journal entry is a more advanced, um, you know, you can almost do anything in it. So I like to typically do a journal. Now I'm not seeing my plus, oh yeah, it's right there. Okay. Um, so I'm going to do plus journal entry. And also a journal entry will balance your credits and debits. So it's guaranteeing that everything is accurate. So the first thing let's do is let's make sure that the date of closing is completely accurate. So it's 315, 2019. Okay. And now my first tip when dealing with a closing statement is to deal with what you know first. All right. There's some big numbers on this that are kind of obvious and I like to get them out of the way to make sure they're in there correctly because they're kind of easy. And again, QuickBooks is going to tell you whether you're right or not. It's not going to let you proceed unless your uh, debits are equal to your credits. Okay. So when I say deal with the big numbers first, the one thing I know for certain is that I'm going to come to closing with 92,000 in cash. I know that. Okay. So why don't I start there? It's going to come from my checking account. Okay. So we can start typing and checking account shows up and to decrease our checking account, meaning I'm coming to the table with that cash, I'm going to credit that. So 92, and that's 969.78, okay? And this is cash at closing. I'm gonna fill in the rest of these descriptions and stuff at the end, we'll leave it for now. So I know that um, part of the money is coming from my checking account. I also know that $5,000 is coming from my earnest money deposit, that thing that we just dealt with, right? So I can type in my escrow, my closing escrow, $5,000, it's a current asset, so $5,000 came from there. So I can just say clear out escrow, okay? And so that's like my contribution is at $97,000. What else is happening here? Well, I know that I'm getting a loan for $380,000. That's how I'm spending, that's how I'm paying for almost all of this, uh, this property, okay? So let's put that in there. Now a loan is gonna be a long-term liability. I like to set up kind of a, you know, a parent account for mortgages. And then below that I have all my different ones. I think I've already set this one up. Yeah. 1254 main street loan. And if I just kind of look at it, you can see it's a long-term liability. It's the only one I have in here right now, but you would have one for all of your properties. If you have multiple loans for a specific property, I would suggest having kind of a parent and then the two below it so that you can see on the balance sheet, your total debt for that property. Okay, now I am coming to the table with $380,000 in this loan. Okay, so you can see that um, 477, 969, 78, that's what I have so far. Okay, now what else is happening? Let's see. Well, we know the property's worth $475,000, so that needs to hit my books somehow. Okay, now really important piece here. 475,000, not all of that can go to the building, not all of that can go to the land. Remember that the IRS only allows you to depreciate buildings. So you need to differentiate that 475 into building and land. So I recommend you talk to your accountant on a strategy for doing that. You need to have some kind of logical way that you're doing it, make sure it's consistent for all your properties. For now, I'm going to just pretend that the building is worth 375 and the land is worth 100,000, just for simplicity. But again, you're going to want to go to your CPA to decide that. So we have two different accounts here. So if I start typing buildings, you're going to see them kind of come up. My building's basis, that's where that purchase is going to happen. And remember, I just said 375 is building. Okay, and then the land is the other part which is 100,000. Okay, so there's my 475. And so I'm kind of like, oh, that's just 10. Okay, so I'm kind of like got my big numbers figured out. My 475, the 477, 969. Now these don't match yet. So um, obviously I need to do something about that. And we're going to. Now, next thing I, I like to deal with is we see these taxes here. I see I see I have a tax credit of a negative thousand here, and then another fifteen ninety three, meaning that um, the seller owes me that much in property taxes. Okay, I'm going to be taking on the burden of those property taxes. They've enjoyed the property from January to March, but they haven't paid the property taxes yet. I'm going to be paying those property taxes for them. Okay, so you're going to pull up your property tax 
cost of goods sold account, okay? And um, we're going to be crediting this to us, okay? Because it's a negative expense. So this is county taxes. It's a negative expense, meaning that um, we're kind of getting refunded for it. We're gonna be paying the bill maybe in like April for like, maybe it's 4,000, but we're getting this, you know, 2,500 back now. So there's two transactions here to deal with those two line items for property taxes. So 1593 and they're both county tax. I don't really understand why they would do that. So I, I don't know, this is just a sample one, but that's how that one works out. Okay, so we're pretty darn close here. Basically we have, and if I could see all that, See if my scrolling can, well, we'll see it at the end for sure. Okay, so the only thing I haven't dealt with is this 55, 62, 78, net seller charges. And this, the details of this shows up on page two of the HUD. All right, so if I scroll down to page two and open this up a little bit, I can see all these settlement charges. Now I don't owe any broker fees. Those are all paid by the seller, but I do have a lot of fees associated with the origination of my loan, uh, appraisal fees, interest charges, um, property insurance, et cetera. Okay, so now here's an important differentiation in the types of expenses that can be deducted in the current year and those that get added to your basis. Okay, so uh, per the IRS guidelines, anything related to financing, you can deduct in this year and you should treat those as a cost of goods sold or an expense. Anything related to title search, appraisals, that kind of thing, that should be put into the basis of your property. And you probably saw on my chart of accounts, I separate those out as amortized closing costs. All right, so I'm gonna show you how to do that. Now, a confusing part about this document is this 5562. It's not necessarily a sum of all these things because some of these are not paid at closing. Some of these are paid out of pocket beforehand. So I'm gonna to try to leave those out and it can get a little confusing. I like to keep my HUD you know, a little different, but um, we're gonna deal with that fine. So we're gonna have at least a few transactions here. Now the first is I'm gonna deal with my finance charges because those are deductible. And so I have a cost of goods sold account for interest and finance charges, okay? So I'm gonna call upon that and I'm gonna put my 1070 in there and I'm gonna call this uh, my origination charge, okay? And now I'm gonna skip down because I have at least one more finance charge, this daily interest, 717.78. Now you could split this out, by the way. You could have interest as one and points as another. For this, it's fine to just have it as one. Now you notice interest paid there. Um, I just saw it come up. I deal with anything that's directly related to a property, I call it cost of goods sold. If I were to have like a line of credit for the business, I would put those interest expenses there, okay? 717.78, and this is daily interest. Okay, so I've dealt with those. Now I have my amortized closing costs, which are kind of all of these, okay? Oh, I actually have property insurance as well. Property insurance is deductible this year as well. So I can put in oops, property insurance, okay? And I spent 475 on that. All right, and then here's the rest of it. I got appraisal, credit report, tax service, flood certification, and then I have, it looks like 1350 closing fee, and then 650 for title insurance. So I'm gonna call all of those amortized closing costs. And remember, I'm not gonna bring this one in there. It's not added in those at 5,500. You could put in line items for all of them. For simplicity, I'm going to put it as one line item and show you a really cool trick within QuickBooks. If I start typing amortized closing costs, I'm gonna add it to closing cost basis. And it's gonna end up being 3,300. Hopefully, that would balance my books. But let's do some addition here. So basically, I'm gonna take these and I'm gonna add them right within QuickBooks. So if you start typing in the cell here, 525 and just hit plus, then add 25 plus 80 plus 20 plus 1350 plus 650, and then hit tab. And I missed one, didn't I? Let's do it again, sorry, my bad. 525 plus 25 plus 80 plus 20 
plus 1350 plus 650. And I'm 650, I'm short by some money. What is going on here? Ah, we have some more down here, don't we? All right, so we have plus 150 plus 500. And there it is, okay, so I forgot that 150 and then this 500 down here. And I can just call this settlement charges. Okay, and now I think I'm balanced. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pop this open. Okay, so I can see it fully. And we can see that my debits and my credits match. So I'm in good shape here. Now I do wanna tag these all to this property because I wanna be able to pull a report that shows me, you know, what is my balance sheet look like for this property. So I'm just gonna copy and paste these in here. And again, I'm gonna leave class blank, at least for this. Now you could use class for like differentiating between rental property versus rehab property, or maybe a different region, state, something like that. I would also suggest uh, upload the HUD directly to the, to the journal entry. And just hit save and close. We're missing class fields, that's no problem. And that will close up and you can see that my checking account went down. I spent a bunch of cash out of there. My closing escrow cleared out. And then my fixed assets are increasing. So I have 3,300 in closing costs. I have 375 in buildings and I have 100,000 in land. And I have a $380,000 loan as well. My net income is currently positive because of all that tax credit I got, all right? So now things are looking pretty good. I could take this because I recorded by customer, I could display columns by customers and that'll show me for 1254 Main Street, I don't care too much about the assets and um, you know this stuff here, but here I can see that my values are attributed to 1254 Main Street. All right, so if you had multiple properties, you'd be able to see what everything is. And I like being able to kind of use these arrows to bring things up and I can just kind of I can even just do this and say like, here's the total value in my books of um, 1254 Main Street. All right, so uh, that's how you record a HUD. Now, um, HUDs can get more complex than that, certainly. So if you have any questions when you were recording one of yours, you had some issues, feel free to add a comment or reach out to me directly and we'll talk through it. You know, if there's a construction loan, multiple loans, anything like that, anything, a little bit more complex, I'd be happy to review that with you, all right? And then certainly if there's anything else related to QuickBooks accounting, real estate accounting that uh, you need help with, certainly ask a question or email me directly and we'll talk through it, all right? Until next time, check out all the free resources available at IncomeDigs.com. There's a really great real estate investing setup guide that I'm gonna link to here as well. And until next time, we'll see you on the next video. Thanks.